This here is one of the most hotly anticipated cars to be launched in Malaysia in 2023, the Tesla Model 3 facelift, codenamed Highland. We've got a couple of hours with this car before customer delivery start at the end of this year. So in this video, I'm going to run you through what I like, what I don't like about this car within our brief experience with it. So what's the Model 3 like to drive on Malaysian roads? Let's go find out in this video. This here is a midlife facelift, but the changes go far deeper than just skin deep. They've changed the entire front end, and in fact, most of the body panels are new for the facelift. Going even deeper, the mechanicals have had quite a few overhauls as well. The suspension, the NVH package, pretty much everything is almost entirely new for this car. But even more important for Malaysian buyers is that deliveries will start for the early customers before the end of this year, 2023. That's even earlier than Tesla's own home country, the US. That's partly because the one we are getting is built in China, Giga Shanghai, whereas the ones in the US will be built there where production starts a little bit later compared to Shanghai. Malaysia, in fact, is going to be one of the earliest countries in the entire world to begin deliveries of the Model 3. Now, how often can we say that? Now, of course, part of that is because in most other countries, they are transitioning from the pre-facelift model to this new version, whereas in Malaysia, this is the first Model 3 we are getting officially. Now let's move on to pricing where Tesla Malaysia has effectively crushed the rest of the EV market. The Model 3 now starts from just 189,000 ringgit for the rear wheel drive standard range version, while this dual motor all wheel drive long range version starts at 219,000 ringgit. On the face of it, I would say that the long range is the better pick of the two because compared to the Model Y, this is about 30,000 ringgit cheaper, whereas the standard range Model 3 is only 10,000 ringgit less than the far bigger, far more practical Model Y equivalent. But of course, this being a new facelift, if you always need to have the latest and greatest version of everything, this is the one to get. I mean, if you buy the Model Y now, within say six months, a year from now, when the Juniper facelift comes out, it's gonna look something like this. So yeah, if you buy a Model Y now, it's gonna look very outdated really soon. Moving on to looks, like I said, the entire front end is effectively all new. The bonnet, front fenders, headlights, bumper are all new for the facelift. This is without a doubt one of the most significant midlife cycle updates across any brand recently. The slimmer, sharper headlamps certainly give this car a much more modern look and it looks closer to the Tesla Roadster concept we've seen from a couple of years ago. The lights especially do make the Tesla Model 3 look a lot less, you know, bug-eyed, frog-eyed, however you want to call it from before. However, you do lose out on the front fog lamps that were available in the pre-facelift model. And while I do think the front end looks better than before, more modern especially, it does look a little bit characterless, a little bit generic, I would say. What do you think of this? Do let me know in the comments below. The wheel designs are new for the facelift too. As standard, you get 18-inch wheels, which are pretty much covered by a full plastic cover. That's for better aero properties. But you can upgrade to these 19-inch alloys for 7,500 ringgit. And these do have additional plastic caps between the spokes, but overall, this is much better looking, definitely worth the extra price. You can see either T1 or T0 marks on the tire, similar to how Mercedes tires have the MO badge or BMW tires are star marked. Here in Malaysia, you can get exact replacement tires at Tesla service centers, or should I say center, because right now there's only one. Speaking of optional extras that you have to pay extra for, that also extends to the color options. The white that you see here is the standard color, but if you want any other color besides white, you have to pay extra for it. Choose the black or the blue, that's going to be an extra 5,000 ringgit. The new stealth grey is an additional 7,500, or the red is an extra 11,000 ringgit. 
the options do add up pretty quickly. So if you pick a few of the boxes, your 189,000 car is suddenly gonna be about 210, while the long range is suddenly gonna be a 250,000 ringgit car. That is going to be especially critical by the time the luxury tax comes in next year. Say the base car at 189 is well below the 200,000 ringgit threshold, but pick a few options, you might go beyond the limit and you may have to pay an additional 20,000 ringgit worth of tax. So do be mindful of that if you're looking to buy the car next year. Back to looks, the taillights have this far more futuristic design to it and to go along with that, there is also a new bootlet design with Tesla now spelled out in full. The rear bumper is new as well, so like I said before, pretty much all the body panels have been swapped out for this facelift. In fact, the only pieces that are carried forward from before are the side doors and the rear fender. Everything else, brand new for the facelift. If you look closely, you also notice that the taillights now have a single piece design, whereas the old one were split two piece units. This sure looks far better than before, and I'm sure there is a cost benefit to that as well. But as the entire light cluster lifts as you open the boot, it does look a little bit awkward with the boot open now. But before we move on, I do have to mention this. This particular car does have quite a few inconsistent panel gaps all around the vehicle. It's nowhere near as bad as the car that we filmed at the launch, but these inconsistencies certainly do not look good for Tesla. However, we have been told that these are pre-production units for now, so hopefully customer vehicles will be much better. Moving on inside, at first glance, you may think that this looks pretty much exactly the same as the pre-facelift Model 3. And, well, I guess you wouldn't be wrong there because there are just a few minor touches, minor differences here and there. But the changes are quite significant. I think the biggest one of all is the seat comfort over here. The seats do feel much more comfortable, far softer, far more supportive than before. And for the first time, you do get seat ventilation on the Model 3. In Malaysia, yeah, that is a massive help. And then pretty much all the major touch points, the center armrest over here, the top of the door cards, the armrest on the doors as well, they are softer, they do feel higher quality than before. They've also switched out pretty much all of the wood panels from before into all these, you know, more modern metallic pieces, all this fabric covers at the top. And they've also added this full width ambient lighting system across the entire dashboard. Again, small, small touches, but it does make the car feel far more modern than before. It's the same with the screen as well. It looks pretty much the same as before, but the bezels are just a little bit thinner. It looks slightly better than before. This is like a, you know, an incremental iPhone year on year update, I would suppose. But of course, what pretty much everyone will talk about is the new steering wheel design and the lack of any stocks behind it. So yes, you no longer have a signal stock on the left and no longer have a drive selector stock on the right. So now, if you need to indicate whether left or right, you have to press this individual buttons on the steering wheel, which yep, will take some getting used to. In about an hour of me driving this car, I don't think it's that bad, but I think there will be a few instances, like say you are on you know, a very tight turn and you suddenly have to turn off and click the signal button over here. I don't think it makes too much sense, but day to day, most of the time, I'd say 95% of driving, these buttons would feel just fine. If the Model 3 is going to be your only car, that's fine. You'll get used to this very, very quickly. But if you're cycling through maybe two or three cars, you know, you get used to your normal car, jump into this, have to get used to that, then get back into your normal car. It's just going to be a constant learning process every time you jump into the Model 3 again. Now I know Tesla is not the very first car brand to have this system over here. Ferrari has had it for a couple of years and so has Lamborghini. But remember, those two brands did it for practical reasons. They've had to fit such massive pedal shifters on the side, so it doesn't make sense to have a signal stock behind the big pedal shifters. Here, Tesla has just done it purely 
on a cost basis. Not having stocks in the back reduces their cost, makes the car cheaper to produce. That's why we're having these buttons over here. Other changes to the steering wheel make far more sense. You now have a single button to flash a high beam. So yeah, it's easier than pulling a stock. That is for sure. I'll give them that. And then you've got a single button for camera press a button over there so you call out all the cameras in your car i think that makes good sense as well plus there's also a button to call up your windscreen wipers that makes it easier to call all these functions out so yes that is definitely a benefit to tesla's craziness i would suppose as for selecting gears, previously Tesla utilized a Mercedes-style signal stock on the right of the steering wheel. Now the stock's completely gone, so you select gears by, of all things, using this center screen over here. So you now hold the brakes and swipe up for drive or swipe down for reverse. And just in case the screen ever fails, for whatever reason, don't worry, there are backup buttons up here. But having said that, if for whatever reason the screen does fail, you won't be able to adjust the aircon controls at all because as usual, everything on this car is embedded within the touchscreen system. You control the aircon through there and it's not just talking about the fan speed or the target temperature. You even adjust the aircon vents using the screen over here where it blows left or right, up or down. It's all through the screen, whether you know, that's a good thing to have or just absolute insanity, you tell me. You also adjust your side mirrors or your steering wheel through the screen over here. You call that up and then use the scroll buttons to yeah, move your steering wheel up or down. Again, that is only something that you will end up using just once and completely forget about it. So that's not an issue to me at all. It's the same with the entire touchscreen interface as well. Yes, there are small little buttons. Yes, you will take some time to get used to it, but eventually you will. Once you get used to this car, maybe a few days, maybe a week, maybe a month in, this will become second nature. You will know exactly where each button is, where each functions can be found. So that's completely fine. There is also no support for Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, but again, that's not an issue at all because Tesla has its own really good map functions. It actually uses Google data as well, Google traffic data. So you can just use it to navigate to wherever you want. You can find pretty much everything you want on this map and it will navigate you there using Google map traffic information to get there in the best possible time and route. That's exactly the same if you were to use Google maps on your phone as well. But if you are a Waze user, yeah, there's gonna be a slight difference there. For music, this also has native support for Spotify, Tidal, Apple Music apps and so on. So all you have to do is log in through the screen and you'll have all your playlists, all your favorite music available to you at any time. It is going to be as good as a car having Apple CarPlay or Android Auto. Trust me on that. Now, don't spin this around and say I'm just being kind to Tesla and being especially cruel to Proton for the same reasons, not having Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. The biggest difference is the software on the Tesla actually works. The one in the Proton, not so great. The last thing on the screen, I have to tell you about the Tesla vision-based parking sensors. As you can see on the car on the outside, there are no longer single bird's eye parking sensors on the car, both front or rear. It relies solely on the Tesla vision cameras, both front and back, to measure the distance between the car and the object. As you can see over here, I've got one of my camera guys just walking across the back in a straight line, I shall add, but the measurement to the car is, you know, pretty inconsistent. It goes between 40 to up to 80 centimeters, even though the guy is just walking in a straight line, the same distance from the car. So for the most part, it works. Just don't trust the exact, you know, measurement figures, I see. Other than that, this remains a very usable and practical interior. There is a massive cubby hole under here that's really deep as well, a pair of cup holders here, and another deep compartment down there. You also wouldn't find any form of a start button in the car here. As soon as you get in, press the brakes and the car is ready to go. 
As for the key fob, as standard, you don't get one. You get this key card as standard, which you can actually pair in your phone, and then your phone becomes the key to the car. You can just keep your key in your pocket, walk up towards the car, the car unlocks by itself. Get in, press the brakes, the car starts. And then once you're done, park up, walk away from the car, and the car locks all by itself. It is a fantastic integration for having the key inside your phone. But of course, if you are a traditionalist, you can have the optional key fob as an extra option. One last thing is the sound system on this car. This does not carry any fancy branding whatsoever. No Burmester, no Harman Kardon, no Bowers and Wilkins. This is Tesla's own system, which also means it's not paying any sort of royalty fees to any other brand, but it sounds absolutely fantastic. This has 17 speakers, a few more than the pre-facelift version, and trust me, it is one of the best sound systems I've had on any car, on any brand, even though this is technically a brandless sound system. It's way better than, you know, even a Bowers and Wilkins or Harman Kardons I've heard before. Yeah, it's absolutely great. In the back here, I would say the legroom is pretty decent. It's about the same as, say, a BMW 3 Series or a Mercedes-Benz C-Class. But having said that, it is also nowhere near as spacious as a Hyundai Ioniq 6. That is massive. This is just all right. It's the same with the headroom as well. It's not too bad, but if you're especially tall, you may have to slouch down a little bit to not knock your head on the glass over here. For your reference, I am only 167 centimeters tall, but I've got you know, just about, say, two inches of clearance left. The seats themselves are, again, far more comfortable than before. They just feel softer, more supportive, even though the actual seating position isn't all that great. As you can see, it is still set relatively low compared to the floor. So sitting up straight, I've got my knees up in the air. It's almost as if I am squatting. It's nowhere near as bad as in the Model S, for instance, but it's nowhere near as good as in the Model Y either. And the backrest, they've also adjusted the angle a little bit, you know, a little bit like the Pro Dua Beza. They came up with a sedan for the first time. The angle was not perfect, so people complain about it. So for the facelift, they've adjusted it a little bit. Here, I think it's just fine. It's still a little bit too upright for my own personal taste, but it's not too bad. I think it's fine. Near for the facelift are these all-around ambient lighting, plus the windows, even the rears, are now double-layer, double-glazed windows. The previous versions only had that for the front, the rears used traditional windows. Now it is far, far quieter sitting in the back here. And then if you option in the white seats for an additional 5,000 ringgit, the door cards turn white as well, so there is a much bigger contrast compared to before where it's just the seats that are white. All new for the facelift is this center screen over here, which again, you use to control where the wind would blow through the vents. You can also use it to adjust the fan settings, the volume settings at the front, or even move the front seat if you need extra space like so. That is pretty cool. You can even watch Netflix or YouTube down here, which is interesting, but I do have to say the screen position is a little bit too far down. So sitting up straight, looking down for, you know, half an hour is going to be a little bit tiring. One last thing is the sunroof on the Model 3. It is standard across the entire range. So even if you buy the basic version, you get a glass roof as well. Beyond that, there is no sunshade for this car as standard. There is an optional Tesla accessory for it, but you do have to pay extra for that. As it is under Malaysian sunshine, it's not all that bad unless you've got one of those scorching hot days like today. Today, I wish we had the sunshade though. As for the boot, the Model 3 has a rather small boot space of just around 400 litres. That is significantly smaller than say a BMW 3 Series or a Mercedes-Benz C-Class again, but it's not exactly tiny, it is definitely usable. Beyond that, you also have your front trunk that you can use to fit your backpacks or charging cables and so on. It's just that the only way is to open the front bonnet is via the centre screen inside the car or via an app on your mobile phone, so it's not quite as easy as opening up the rear boot, for instance. So we're finally driving the Tesla Model 3 Highland facelift on Malaysian roads. Now, 
as with all my videos, I usually start with the numbers, the PS, horsepower, newton meters, and so on. But this being a Tesla, it doesn't want to bore you with all those you know, numbers that don't really mean anything to you. There is no physical meaning to those numbers anyway. So Tesla, they just tell you how fast the car can go from 0 to 100. If you buy the standard range, it gets there in 6.1 seconds. That's something that you can actually feel, something you can actually measure as well. For the long range, because it's all-wheel drive, dual motors, it gets there slightly quicker at just 4.4 seconds. This has an official 0 to 100 figure of just 4.4 seconds, making it as quick or even quicker than full-blown Mercedes AMG or BMW M models. And in practice, in the real world, I'd say it's even faster than that. The response is absolutely explosive. It's immediate. It doesn't matter what sort of transmission you have in your high-powered sports car, whether it's a DCT or even a single clutch SMG or whatever it is, it cannot react as quickly as an EV. There is absolutely no chance. So even if you have a Mercedes-Benz AMG or a BMW M car with similar performance numbers, say 4 seconds, 4.4 seconds, trust me, this feels much quicker than what you have. It's especially telling when it comes to rolling acceleration. Say your car's already moving, you just plant your foot down and the car just jumps forward like, yeah. Trust me, it's much quicker than your car. The experience and the performance will change depending on what variant you get. Like I said, if you buy the standard range, it'll be a fair bit slower, 6.1 seconds versus 4.4 in this one. And later on, there is going to be a Tesla Model 3 performance, or if the rumors are true, it's gonna be called the Plaid. But whatever it's gonna be called, that is gonna be even faster still. So on performance, much has been said about Tesla's performance, acceleration and so on. I shall not bore you with that. I have limited time with this car anyway. So let's move on to other things. I mean, in terms of the electric motors and the batteries, it has not changed since the facelift. So this has the same battery as before. Tesla wouldn't say how big it actually is because again, it doesn't want to bore you with numbers that don't have any real meaning. But if you look through you know internet sources you can say that this has an 82 kilowatt hour battery pack and within an hour of me driving this car i have averaged about 13.8 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers so that works out to just over 600 kilometers of total range with this car which is close enough to the 629 kilometer range that this car claims. Now, of course, I will need a lot more time driving this car through the usual roads that I usually drive through with my own cars to see how well this compares against other EVs that I've tested. But from what I've seen, around 13.8, I would think I can get even lower than that. So yeah, it is excellent from what I've seen just yet between 13 and 14 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometer energy consumption is actually very very good for a car that has this level of performance i mean the hyundai ionic 6 that i tested a few weeks ago did average about the same but remember that was a lower powered rear wheel drive setup only the all-wheel drive version had much higher energy consumption this even though it has dual motors it still manages to go below 14 per 100 that is excellent now let's move on to refinement and that's where this car has massive improvements over the pre-facelift version. Now I have driven the pre-facelift Model 3 quite a few times, although those were all grey market cars. This is the very first official car coming from Tesla Malaysia, in our country of course. But compared to those older cars, this is markedly quieter, markedly more comfortable than pretty much all previous Teslas I've driven. Even the Tesla Model Y, the official version in Malaysia with you know much softer suspension than before, this is softer, this is quieter, more comfortable still. So it's clear that Tesla has made plenty of adjustments, plenty of improvements under the skin as well. It's not just a matter of changing the dampers, the springs and so on they've also adjusted the suspension geometries the suspension links the steering links to make everything just that little bit quieter that little bit more refined so even wind noise i've already mentioned the rear windows are now double glazing as well so as you drive along yeah i'm driving at 
80 kilometers per hour right now and I hardly hear any sort of wind noise. There is a little bit of road noise coming in but Tesla claims that there is a big improvement for that as well because there's a fair bit more insulation throughout the entire car. Now remember, when we are talking about electric cars, noise insulation, refinement is doubly important because with normal cars, you will always have that engine note as a baseline that will mask you know, all the additional noise coming into the cabin. But with an electric car, the car is practically silent as it glides along. So the noise is always there. It always feels far more apparent than in an ICE car. So it's not to say that old Model 3 was a noisy car inside, but driving it, you definitely tend to listen, tend to notice the tire noise, the road noise, the wind noise, a little bit more than a conventional ICE car. This one, however, it's right up there with the very best. It's, yeah, it is amazing. Other than the annoying buzzing on the right side over here, which we can't find the source for, it is as quiet in here than say a Mercedes-Benz EQS, which is about three times the price of this one. So yeah, in terms of refinement, Tesla has knocked it out of the park with the Model 3 facelift. Now let's talk about the suspension and the ride quality. As mentioned, there's massive improvements in this department as well. Again, Tesla has done this the right way, the cost effective way, instead of putting in very expensive technologies like air suspension or adaptive dampers on this car, Tesla has gone the way of using um, what they call frequency selective damping. This is similar to what Mercedes-Benz uses on most of their lower end cars as well as what Kia uses on its EV6. This is technically a passive set of dampers but it can change characteristics depending on the roads you're on, depending on what you're doing with the car. So as it is, it works really, really well through our usual test roads in Cyberjaya and Putrajaya. It feels super comfortable. It doesn't jump around so much. It doesn't really have that very typical busy feel with most EVs. This feels very nicely damped across you know, a wide variety of roads. Again, I'll need more thorough testing to see how well this goes against say a Mercedes C-Class or BMW 3 Series or the Hyundai Ioniq 6. But first impressions are certainly very, very good. I think if you take this car on a short test drive, you will be very impressed with it. I will mention this though, knowing how low slung this car is, you actually feel like you're sitting really high inside this car. This has a lot to do with the seating position and the very low window line. At the front, you can actually see over the bonnet. You can't do that on many cars these days. It does give you that sort of SUV-like commanding driving position, making it very, very easy to position the car through tighter bends or you know tight parking lots. This being a very low slung done I quite like that but one issue I do have however are the really thick A pillars on both sides so even though you get a good view out these thick pillars on both sides may block your views you know in you know certain dangerous positions as well so yeah there's a few positives there's a few negatives but overall I'm absolutely fine with this seating position just a quick note on the signal buttons you may wonder if this would have the one touch three click functions like in most other cars technically it does not because there is only one way to indicate just pressing the button you can't press it halfway for it to just blink three times what it does have however is auto cancel so i'll just press it one time and then merge to the left the car will detect whether i've changed lanes or not and once i've done that it cancels the signal that's pretty clever i'd say like I mentioned, I think most people will get used to this very, very quickly, especially if this is going to be the only car that you drive. But at the same time, I can also think of quite a few moments, a few instances where you've got all your hands crossed up and you can't find the correct buttons to press. That is going to be a little bit annoying, I'd say. Last but not least, just a quick display of the autopilot on this car. Just click the button twice and autopilot is on so the car now practically drives itself i don't have to touch the steering wheel or the pedals at all so yeah even though we are in putrajaya and you know all the road markings aren't exactly the best but the car is definitely sticking to the right center of the lane really really well you can even see what the car is detecting 
around it. Like the lack of parking sensors, this car now solely relies on cameras around the car. You can see there was a car that passed by, there's a car on the display as well. This to me adds a lot of extra confidence to the driver just to know that the car is actually aware of what's around it. You tend to trust it a lot more than most other cars without this big display. As you can see, I kept looking for the indicator stocks right there, but that's only because I've only been driving this car for an hour or so. I'm very sure if I drive this car for a week, maybe two weeks or a month, yeah, that's not going to be an issue anymore. And mind you, there has been a little bit of a confusion with this autopilot system. This system I'm showing you right here is the absolute basic system that comes with the car. You don't have to pay extra for the enhanced autopilot at all to get this full so-called level 2 semi-autonomous driving feature. As it is, even the basic car can drive itself. If you pay that additional, what is it, 16,000 ringgit, you can get additional features such as automatic lane change. Eventually, you will get the summon feature as well. But trust me, you don't really need it as it is just the basic autopilot system is more than good enough for Malaysian roads. So that's our quick review of the new Tesla Model 3 Highland facelift here in Malaysia. Now in short, calling this a mere facelift would be a massive understatement in itself because Tesla has made plenty of improvements across the board, not only in terms of looks, but much, much deeper inside as well. Of course, it does look better now, at least to my eyes, and the interior has had quite a few refinements and improvements pretty much everywhere that you can see or touch but much more significant is the improvements in terms of how it drives it is now far more comfortable far quieter as well it's not without faults of course the lack of stocks behind the steering wheel will take some getting used to and the inconsistent panel gaps and the quality issues that we've seen on this car even though we've only had it for a few hours is a little bit suspect in the long term I would say. But overall I will still say that Tesla Model 3 is an absolutely superb electric sedan in the Malaysian market. It's priced incredibly well and it single-handedly makes pretty much everything else in the market look overpriced, absurdly overpriced even. So that's about it for a quick review. What do you think of it? What do you think of what I like or don't like about this car? If you have differing opinions, do let me know in the comment section below. For now, thank you for watching and stay safe everyone.